Good morning, everyone. In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of all the members and friends of Herondale Presbyterian Church, welcome to our service for this third Sunday after Pentecost. And happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. I can tell you it's great to be a father and a grandfather too. Now looking where everybody is, maybe next week we can all sit in different places. How would that be? No, it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. My dad and mother used to sit in the last pew by the aisle, and if somebody was visiting and they sat there, they got the stink eye from my dad and, and mother. They really did. But happy Father's Day. Birthdays for this coming week, June the 22nd, Joe Fleur and Jean McRae. And June the 24th, Joan Spurrio. So happy birthday to those three. Prayer requests, continue to pray for all those listed in your newsletter and your bulletin. Uh, from Dorothy Ramsey, she has two prayers. Pray for the people of Philadelphia affected by the collapse on 95. And pray for her cousin Peggy Campbell, who is having a left knee replacement tomorrow. Chris Hartzell also asked for prayers for his aunt Sandy Fleischer, who is having heart surgery. Announcement. As per the announcement in the newsletter, we need someone or ones to pick up breads and desserts at East Park Giant on Tuesdays. If you need more information, see me or Marla or the Minix. We can help you out. Just this Tuesday, Tuesday only, office hours for Susan are going to be from 2 to 4. That's correct, isn't it, Susan? Okay, she's listening. Good. 2 to 4. And uh, the next communion will be on July the 9th. July the 9th. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Please rise in body or in spirit as we are all called into worship. Worship the Lord with gladness. We come into God's presence this day. For the Lord our God is good. Now please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number one, God is here.
Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand. With confidence in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Loving God, without your grace, we are like sheep without a shepherd. Sometimes we are harassed by sin and feel helpless against its power. Sometimes in our sin, we use our own power to harass the helpless. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and bring us home. Restore us to your flock and fold. In the name of Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, we pray, amen. Hear the good news of God's love. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of Christ be with you. And also, please stand as we sing glory to God whose goodness shines on me. don't see any children here today but if you are let's say young at heart maybe a teacher a teacher miss Sonia uh, <laughs> come on up come on up and join us miss Nancy we're gonna nod to you you don't have to come over this way but <laughs> yeah <laughs> Childlike, childlike. No childlike. <laughs> <laughs> so something for you changed this week. Oh, yeah. Maybe something in. Vacation. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, does your school or your school maybe, especially with what you do, Miss Nancy, do you have any rules about the kinds of shoes kids are supposed to wear, or that you're supposed to wear? Close-toed shoes. Yeah. I know the preschool, they want closed toed. They want to make sure that they stay on their feet when you're running around outside or, yeah. So they want something that ties a lot of times too. I am not used to seeing you in shoes that tie, nor with socks. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the perks of adulthood is you get to pick whatever shoes you wear. As long as your job doesn't make you wear certain things. Um, and deciding how stinky your feet are going to be, because I don't like socks. So, <laughs> so I wear them it's cold, but it's not cold now. No. Um, no. And we don't have to follow school rules. You guys both have open toe shoes on now. So you can switch out of these. I'll do a little Mr. Rogers here. <laughs> so these can go. Don't have to set a good example. You can put on some sandals. I was going to say, if you were going to go to the grocery store later today, or just about anywhere else, that I'm, I'm glad to see the sandals go back on your feet. <laughs> I mean, I like no shoes better, but so, that's pretty much something that stays the same, though. If you're going out in public, most places want you to have shoes on. If you go to the store, library, most of the time in church, most of most Sometimes of the time. in church you wear shoes. <laughs> when you're here for youth group, things might shift a little. Yeah. 
So seasons change and our shoes might change, but we still usually wear shoes. What on earth does that have to do with Jesus? You, you've got a new pastor here. She's wondering where we're going with this. <laughs> where are we going with this? So one thing or one person stays the same, no matter what we're doing, where we are, if we're wearing shoes or not, what would, who do we think, what might that be? Any ideas? Jesus, yes! <laughs> yes. Jesus stays with us. He stays the same. Even when we go through changes, like what teachers have this week. They went from, I can't wait for these students to succeed, to, thank God they're out my door. Um, or if we're busy or relaxing, if we're wearing our closed toe shoes, our lace-up shoes, our motorcycle boots, our sandals, our flip-flops. Yes, or even when we're barefoot, God is with us, God loves us no matter what. And if we're wearing shoes or we aren't. So let's say a prayer and then we could head back to our seats. God, we thank you that you are so constant, that you're steadfast no matter what changes in our lives, what pace that we're going at at any given season, you are the same and you are always with us. Amen. Amen. prayer for illumination. Lord God, by your spirit, teach us to obey your voice and keep your covenant so that we may be a priestly kingdom, your holy people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and then 10 through 23, and can be found in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible, page nine. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out 
and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphas and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts. No bag for your journey or two tunies or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is in it worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not, your words shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Saddam and Gonorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to the councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated, by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Please join me in prayer. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that being taught by your, you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> that is a long and challenging passage. It is, speaks to all Christians' dependence upon Jesus. And it certainly is there with the 12 that he commissioned on that day. They were commissioned to do quite a lot of work, to step out and be dependent on Jesus and to believe that they could cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin disease, and cast out demons. They were to live each day dependent on God, taking no gold or silver or copper or even a bag on their journey. And then there's that part where they will enter into people's homes and then if they're not welcomed, leave. Don't work too hard. Just leave. Shake off the dust from your feet and leave that house or town. And they are being sent out like sheep into the midst of wolves. 
this is pretty terrifying. This is a pretty terrifying commission. Jesus wants them to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And they're not to worry about how they will speak. Why? Because the Father will speak through them. So sharing in the love of God in Christ Jesus is going to be tough. Matthew reminds his church that there will be siblings that rise up against sibling fathers that will rise up against children. This is an extraordinarily challenging text. Now it helps to understand the meaning and what Matthew was saying to his congregation when we understand the background of the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm going to be referring to this background as we make our way up toward Advent. We will be reading, uh, if we read from the Gospel reading, it will be Matthew. We're in year A, that's what we'll read up right until the end of November. And what's helpful, I don't know how many of you have the new, new Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but what's helpful is in the introduction to the Gospel, there's some facts in there about who Matthew's audience is when he wrote this. He's writing it predominantly to his congregation that had a Jewish background. They are people that had been in the Jewish faith. They believe in Jesus. They're following Jesus. They have heard or testified to his life and his death and his resurrection. And they're busy wondering where this Messiah is. They were anticipating his return. They believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of scriptures. Now, we, um, we can see, when you read Matthew, you see certain pieces within that gospel that are always pointing back to the Old Testament or Torah and speak to how Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. So if you remember, the opening part of the gospel of Matthew is testifying to Jesus' lineage. He is a descendant of Abraham. And you, we, you will see, we will see this in a variety of places as we walk through the book. Now it's thought that Matthew was written after the first Jewish revolt in, against Rome. So that was around 70 CE, Christian era. So we're within that first century of the new era and the Jews had revolted against Rome the temple was destroyed. And what that meant was there was a tremendous amount of political turmoil that was going on. There was this question of what does the Jewish tradition look like moving forward? And the Pharisees, who were known for being the interpreters in the prophets and of the law, they are the premier religious leaders at the time. And there's this tension over who will govern Israel. If there is no temple, how will Israel be governed? Matthew's congregation, Matthew's people who are striving to follow Jesus, who they believed were the Messiah, was the Messiah, is the Messiah, they are wrestling within this context. There's this political turmoil going on within their own state. Rome is oppressing them. Now this part is not in the NRSV, but it's important to know that starting around 64 AD, so several years before we believe the Gospel of Matthew was written, Nero has begun to persecute Christians. He's burning them. So the, the text in which the letter, the gospel, where Matthew was written, is a people who they had known their Jewish tradition. They had come to know and believe in Jesus as the fulfillment of scripture, and yet he hasn't returned yet. He's asking, they're asking, where is he? Look at all this suffering that is happening. The political turmoil, the religious turmoil. 
When will he come back? So when it talks about brother and sister, or brothers and fathers and family separating, these are Christian people who are rising up and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to believe in the Messiah. Well, perhaps they have, in my mind's eye, I picture that perhaps they have family members who are saying, he hasn't come back yet. They're trying to figure out who they are and where they'll go. And it's into this upheaval that Matthew encourages his congregation to stay the course. It is in the testimony of this gospel that we too, as a people, in 2023, can find encouragement to stay the course. We are a dependent people. We are as dependent upon Jesus as they were in that first century. And Alexander Wimberly, who is a, um, a, a minister in Belfast, North, North I or Ireland, he wrote this. It is in Christ who enables us to do what we could not do on our own. This passage, referring to what Nancy read, leaves as a mystery why Christ includes us in his mission and how exactly we meet success through him. But the faithful do achieve miraculous things. Perhaps it is because Jesus continues to have compassion on shepherdless sheep. Perhaps it is because prayers have been answered and enough laborers have been sent out into the bountiful harvest. Perhaps the words of the Father's spirits have been spoken through the right people at the right time. Matthew's congregation was completely dependent upon the risen Christ to carry out and stay the course to share Jesus' love with the world. And it's that same message that was shared with them, them that is shared with us. So the task before us, Herondale Presbyterian Church, us, it's not easy. It's, we are living in this forever shifting culture and let's face it, our culture is not too interested in what we have to share. But as Wimberly states, it is in Christ who enables us to do what we could not do on our own. We are dependent upon him and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And how we step into the future may feel like a mystery right now. But we are the faithful that are called to carry the faith into the future and be part of the great mystery of our faith, which it, it, knowing that Jesus includes us in his mission. We are as included in Jesus' mission as was Matthew's congregation those first century Christians. Now, we may not always understand how we will have success, but as Wimberly reminds us, the faithful achieve miraculous things. Do any of you walk through your day going, I am a follower of Jesus, and as a congregation, we're going to achieve miraculous things. I say this in jest, but this is the promise of the Holy Spirit. We will be gifted with vision and anticipation if we remember to whom we belong. We belong to Jesus. We will be led forward, just like Matthew's congregation was led forward to share their faith with generations that followed. Now, we've been thinking about this history and this lineage of how the message and the love of Christ is passed down from generation to generation. And I was blessed that uh, two of our volunteers were in the office. Well, there are many volunteers in the office, and I 
I felt blessed by all of them this week. But two of them pointed, me, pointed to me, well, reminded me that we're celebrating Herondale's 75th anniversary this year. And then what happened was the booklet that was shared at your 50th anniversary, anniversary was placed on my table. And of course, I had to pick it up. And there it said, yeah, there, there's an article written, and I'm sorry, I did not quite understand who wrote it, but it was titled 50th Anniversary, Oh, A Time to Remember. That was the title of the booklet. And then within it, there is these sections, and perhaps you remember this. There are the first five years of the church, there are the next 20, and then there are the next 25. And now, last week, when I mentioned that we were in a new chapter, I wasn't quite putting together that we were entering into the 75th celebration, and, well, we are actually about the business of faithfully following where Jesus would like us to go, and we're setting some stage, the stage for the next chapter. Will that be another 25 years? What struck me was this. Opening in this book, in the writing um, under 50th anniversary, oh, oh, anyway, was this, was this paragraph. What did God say to those 38 original members of Herondale Community Church at their organizational meeting at 4 p.m. on July 11th? 1948. I can imagine it when something like this. Men and women of Herondale, this is the Lord. You have suffered through four long years of war. I have brought you to this Herondale haven. This is a time to beat your swords into plowshares. It is time to join together. I'm pleased the community wants to worship me in a community church. I will take care of everything. I have the cornerstone ready for you. I will always be with you. The Lord has spoken. It's very humbling to hear the voice of those that fought in World War II and to hear the authors of this article write, we have suffered or, through four long years of war. And I have brought you to this Heron Dale Haven. Returning from the war and striving to thrive in the Lord, seeing God's faithfulness in each person that returned home, the author continued with this. Many of the people God placed in Heron Dale community were just back from the war. Wet box holes and ship's bunks were exchanged for warm little two or three bedroom houses. The industry that assembled in a line the implements of war was converted to assembling the abodes of peace. Nothing fancy, but certainly cozy enough to start a family. It was time to replace praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. With praise the Lord, pass the bread and the cup. So much a part, of our, a part of our Reformed tradition is experiencing the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and being so moved that you cannot help but respond in worship and prayer. And the faithful that have gone before us, the founders of Herondale Presbyterian Church, had seen hardship, known grief, Convinced of God's faithfulness, they planted a church. A church where God is praised, Jesus is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is welcomed, and God's love is taken into the community. When I read these words written 25 years ago about the people who had founded the church 50 years ago, what came to my mind's eye were people who wanted to settle into their, their Herondale Haven. 
where they and their descendants could live and thrive in the loving embrace of God and Christian community. Their response to God's faithfulness is the same as it, the ancients, to lay down the cornerstone and build a place of worship where those that follow will grow in the loving embrace of God and come to know Jesus. Imagine this. We are the people called to lead Herondale Presbyterian Church into the future and to continue Jesus's ministry in this community. And part of our commission is to face, faithfully assess where we are and ask our blessed Trinity where we are to go. And as we embark on this journey, it's to remember that impossible things have been and continue to be done through the faithful. I am graduated from seminary in 2000 in my very last class of seminary our professor stood before us and said well I graduated in 1965 what we did then was put up a church open the doors and people came in and then he rocked back and forth you know how professors do that on their heels toe to heel so, well, it's not that way anymore. Good luck. It, it would have been helpful to hear that on the beginning side of seminary. But um, the point is that what church looks like is changing. What is drawing people into worship is perhaps different. But just as Sarah lifted up, in the children's moment. Jesus' love for Jesus' people and Jesus' commission for us to share that love with one another, to grow in his word and to take it out into the world, that remains. That commission remains. And that's what we're going to be figuring out, where Jesus is uh, going to lead us into the future. That is part of my call here, to work with all of you on discerning those next steps. Now, in this past week, it was brought to my attention that you often recite a statement of faith, and it was too late to get it in, a statement of faith into the bulletin. So in response to the sermon, I actually am going to invite you to stand if you are able. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to the New Testament, page 34. So it's Matthew chapter 28. And if you've read my bio, you know this is something that is central to what I believe. And I believe this is central to the future of this church. So when you're there, let me know. We're going to the Pew Bible, New Testament, Matthew, page number 34, and it's in small print. I had to squint. We're going to start together and recite this, Jesus' words, as our statement of faith today. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Are you all joining me? Okay, I can't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Glad I asked. Yes, please, please stand. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Let us begin. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Part of following our Lord is to uh, share, well, I'll step back. Jesus said, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, we ask the Lord to send us out as laborers for the ho harvest. Let us offer the gifts of our lives to the Lord. we will make is only by his grace every mountain we will climb every ray of hope we shine every blessing left behind is only alone which God supplies strength unknown he will provide Christ in us our cornerstone we will go forth in grace alone every soul supplies strength unknown he will provide Christ in us our cornerstone we will go forth in grace alone
Good and holy God, for your steadfast love and faithfulness, we give you thanks and bless your name. Let our whole lives become songs of gratitude, joy, and praise so that all the earth may know that we are your people and you are our God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For the prayers of the people, I'm coming down so I can be closer with you. So it's Father's Day, and I want to wish all of you a happy Father's Day. Father's Day can be a complex day for some others. Some folks, as you know, may not have had a father or a great father. There are those of you who may have lost your father or your loved one. There are those who had fantastic mentors, father figures. So we are going to pray for the men that have been wonderful fathers to us. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we thank you for the great mystery of our faith. We thank you for the faithful that have gone before us, remembering Matthew and his congregation. Their willingness to proclaim your word and your love despite the hardships their willingness to write down and help us remember your faithfulness to your people. We thank you for the men and the women who founded this church, their response to your loving grace in their lives by creating a cute community where you are the cornerstone. For the men and women who help us to remember that you are with us, we thank you for those men in our lives that have been tremendous mentors. Those who have been our dear fathers, those that have been our dear uncles, those who have been our dear friends. And we remember and we celebrate them in this time of silence. Confident that your grace alone is leading us forward and that we are dependent on you. We uh, lift up to you those who are suffering, those who are seeking your healing presence, those who long for physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, those who may be lonely this day. Reveal to us, O oh Lord, who to reach out to, come alongside, and encourage. May no one within this community be, feel lonely or at odds. May your comforting spirit be with those that are grieving. We look to our wider world and we pray for your wisdom to be with our elected officials. We pray for uh, your wisdom and guidance uh, in we continued uh, celebration to be with our teachers. May they find the rest they need this summer. And Lord, we are so grateful for those who um, have gone before us and we unite our voices with them saying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and claimed people to be serving Jesus in this time and this place. We are a blessed people who have, we have been blessed by the gift of the Holy Spirit and I can see your love for one another. It literally shines forth. Go into this day, into this week, knowing that the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit are with you. And the people of God say,